almost everyone realizes how big the Megami Tensei franchise is. But fewer people are aware that there are dozens and dozens of additional games beyond the already vast catalog we're familiar with. And even fewer have actually played them. And that's because, well, you really can't. In the early to late 2000s, there were seriously a lot of Megami Tensei games released on cell phones in Japan. And I don't mean smartphones, I mean cell phones. I'm talking any Megami Tensei game you can imagine too. You name a series, there were probably like 37 phone games based on it. They had Persona games, Majin Tensei games, Devil Summoner games, a sequel to the original Soul Hackers that wasn't called Soul Hackers 2. Really, it's kind of ridiculous just how much variety there was. Once this technology started to become obsolete, however, and these phones finally had their network services shut down, the games were just gone forever. Unless you find a Japanese phone with the games already installed on it, there's absolutely no chance you'll ever be playing them. At least, that was the case. While it's true that you still can't play the vast majority of these games, some are now available, and more seem to be on the way. See, last year, one of the most significant events in the history of the entire franchise took place. The Japanese company G-Mode, known for their work in porting cell phone games to the Switch and Steam, turned their eyes to Megami Tensei. Specifically, the Megami Tensei Gaiden Shinyaku Last Bible Trilogy. Now, as for why they picked these to start with, I don't know, but it was unprecedented. They were rescuing these games from being lost forever. Just think about that. Right now, you can go on Steam and purchase an entire trilogy of Last Bible games that were already pretty niche in Japan and are practically unheard of here in the West. The games aren't translated, mind you, but they've been preserved, they have English store pages, and just recently, Gmode announced a new port of a cell phone title related to the original Persona. They're going strong, and I think a lot of exciting things are on the horizon. In this video, we have the opportunity to do something pretty crazy. Continuing my already lengthy Last Bible series, I'm going to talk you through the entirety of Megami Tensei Gaiden Shinyaku Last Bible, or simply, Last Bible New Testament, the first entry of the long-lost mobile exclusive trilogy. For the first time in quite a while on the channel, we're going to be flying fully untranslated on this one. As I said, no official translation exists, and there are no fan patches yet. There isn't even any kind of fan-made English script or something to help you through the game, as far as I'm aware. Uncharted territory, if you will. Without spoiling too much, this game introduces some of the most mind-blowing lore ever conceived and links itself to other games in the franchise in ways you'd never believe. It's quite the strange ride, and I really hope this video inspires someone out there to create a translation patch for the game, or at the very least, gets more people to check it out. Playing through a practically unknown cell phone game in Japanese is the type of shit I live for, so I managed to piece together the entire thing for myself, essentially translating it line by line in my head, and then summarizing it all with the help of a dictionary and some excellent fan websites I tracked down. I knew studying Japanese in college would pay off one day, so come on, let me show you some crazy shit. I swear you're not gonna believe what goes down. Press the first option at the main menu to start a new game, and we're on our way. The very first thing we have to do is name the characters we'll be working with in our party throughout the game. First up is our protagonist, who is by default named Rui. For the sake of convenience, I'm going to go ahead and keep the default names for each of the main characters, but I'm going to translate them. That way, those of you unfamiliar with Japanese, you can at least easily see who's who in my party, or who's being mentioned in a conversation or something. This game allows us to write names out in English, which is pretty cool, so we'll take advantage of it. Rui simply translates as Louie. Then we have our female companion, Arisu, or Alice. Last up is our male companion, Lizeru, or Lizelle. When translating Lizelle's name, I actually went out to some Japanese websites and tried to see how fans over there were spelling it. 
It's kind of an uncommon name, and I can think of at least two or three ways to do it. The most common spelling I saw was like this, so that's what I went with. After we finish setting up our party, we're taken to a strange cutscene. Things open up to a dimly lit cave, where a silver-haired man with a staff is speaking in a very commanding voice to some kind of blob monster, demanding that it follow his orders in accordance with their contract. He proudly shouts that he's headed to the time when the world begins and vanishes from the cave, leaving the monster behind. Then, the scene fades out, and we're taken to the game's opening narration. The intro says, A long time ago, or perhaps far into the endless future, there was a planet called Lagaya deep in the reaches of the universe. When the people of Lagaya came to flourish, a demon lord and his beasts arrived and created vast suffering with his armies. Eventually, out of nowhere, angels ascended and bestowed upon the people the gift of Gaia, a great power with which they were able to overthrow the demon lord. The victory, while sweet, wasn't permanent, unfortunately. 100 years after his defeat, the Demon Lord would rise again, and this cycle would repeat endlessly like clockwork, with human champions always rising to the occasion to strike him down. Naturally, the time draws near yet again for the Demon Lord to make his return. Once more, Lagaya will bear witness to the destruction and rebirth of all things, a never-ending story that would come to be known as Last Bible. Now you gotta hand it to him, that's a badass way to incorporate the title of the game right off the bat into the story. After that little intro, the game just cuts to a sandy oasis where that weird dude with the staff lands on his fucking head in the sand and then remarks to himself that he's finally made it. We really aren't given any context yet on who this dude is, or what the monster was, or what he's trying to do with a contract, but he must have wanted to come here for some reason and it seems like, with the monster's help, he's traveled through space, time, or maybe both to get here. The game cuts to black yet again, and then we assume control of the protagonist. Our mom is calling our name, telling us to wake up. She shouts that today is a very, very important day. It's time for the new Gaia Master candidates to be selected. Some real classic JRPG shit, right? I mean, come on. Mom waking us up because we're the chosen one on our special day, I've heard that one before. As she walks over to our bed and nudges us awake, Mom reflects on how many years it's been since our father's been around. So many apparently that she can't remember. In his absence, we're raised by another man, a guy a master, but he's not here either, out fulfilling his duty to protect the planet. While we may not have a father figure present to witness the selection ceremony, we should still hold our heads high and be proud of the warrior we've grown into. With little time to spare, Mom tells us to head outside and go on over to the temple to the north. Alrighty, let's get out there and do it. Step outside, and this is home, the village of Norn. The temple is like 15 steps away from our house. It's not much of a journey, you really can't miss it. The place is filled with almost everyone who lives in town, and they all encourage you forward to speak with the priest. Some of the villagers are talking about a man called Master Vane. This is the aforementioned Gaia Master who brought us up as a child and trained us. Everyone really loves him, he's like the world's biggest celebrity. After the chit chat dies down, the priest welcomes us to the ceremony and begins a little speech, as he reminds us that Gaia Masters lead the people of the world and are charged with the duty of fighting against the Demon Lord. He tells us that in other towns across the land, two others have been selected as Gaia Master candidates, and then extends the same offer to us, urging us to follow in the footsteps of Master Vane and do our best to serve the people of Lagaya. As the ceremony wraps up, predictably, shit goes to hell in a handbasket as the screen shakes and a loud commotion can be heard from outside. You know, this is a lot like the first Last Bible. You'll notice that as things continue to develop. A guy runs in panicking, and the priest demands to know what's going on. We're told that all of a sudden, monsters grouped up outside of the village, took our mother, and then ran off to the west to a place called Mora Cave. 
the priest hurriedly dismisses everyone from the temple, and then, well, kind of just sits around all sad, wishing that Master Vane would come back and do something about all this. Come on, dude, we got this shit. Let's go show him what we got. Unlike the original Last Bible, where the priest is at least nice enough to give you a weapon and a shitty piece of armor, we get jack fucking ass here. So swing on by the weapons shop and pick up a short sword for 150 bucks. You'll notice that the long sword, which costs 600, is a lot better, but for now, this'll do. We're gonna rack up some mega bucks pretty soon and buy out the whole town. After you get a sword, it might be smart to stop by the item shop and get a couple of healing waters to help out with any hiccups on our way to the cave. Take those fateful first steps outside of town, and here we go. The adventure begins. Your first enemy encounter is going to come quick. High encounter rates are kind of a Mega 10 series staple, and the same is true here. But the combat is much quicker and snappier compared to other Last Bible titles, and level ups pop constantly like free fucking candy. Let me give you a rundown on how the system works. When a battle starts, you have six options to choose from. You can fight, have the battle play out automatically, run away, talk, manage your recruits, or view your party's stats. Do I really need to explain what these do again? Probably not, but this game is untranslated and some of you might be new to it. To keep it simple, choosing fight lets you decide between attacking with your equipped weapon, casting a spell, using an item, or defending. Auto battling and running away are pretty self-explanatory. Talking, naturally, lets us negotiate with enemies. You'll see it's grayed out right now. We can't actually try it yet, but don't worry, we'll be getting that ability very shortly. Unfortunately, this game uses the shitty negotiation system from Last Bible 1 and Last Bible Special, where enemies only ask you yes or no questions, and there are preset responses each monster is looking for. No teasing them with money or gemstones in this one. This makes many attempts at negotiation feel like a coin flip, and that's because it basically is. The dialogue is pretty uninteresting too, and repeats constantly. The one saving grace is that sometimes, when you level up enough in an area, enemies can start conversations with you, and it feels a bit easier to get them on your side when that happens. You can also have a party member negotiate in your place once you get them, and the results are kind of mixed. It very rarely worked for me, but if you're tired of trying to answer random ass questions over and over again, the option is there to have someone do it for you. Once you have a demon on your team, they can't level up or be equipped with anything, though some of them do have useful movesets that are worth seeking out. Demons can also be fused together to create better ones, but it feels like a bit of an afterthought in this game. Only one character can fuse demons for you, and you never really need to do it, as some of the best demons can be obtained through the story. It's always a shame to see the demon raising aspect of a Mega 10 game done poorly, but I will cut it some slack for being a very low budget cell phone game. Where this game falls through in the demon gameplay, I believe it excels in other areas. Moving on, managing your party lets you call in recruited demons and swap your party order. Those at the front tend to get hit more than those placed at the back. Finally, looking at your status, actually a very useful screen with a lot of information on it. You can view your equipped items, you can look at resistances to different types of attacks, and of course, you can see your stats that you'll be leveling up. Let's delve into these for a minute. As I said, level ups are very frequent in this game, so the more you know about what these can do for you, the better. See, in Last Bible New Testament, every stat is very useful. By the end of the game, you'll probably have a lot of points in all of them. From the top, first up, we have Vitality. Leveling up Vitality gives you 8 extra HP for each point you put into it. If you want a tanky character, you're gonna want to dump points into this all the time. I don't even know if there's a limit for how high your health can get. By the end of the game, mine reached well over quadruple digits. Next, we have Intelligence. Each point you put into Intelligence 
boosts your MP by 3, makes your spells stronger, and helps you learn new spells faster. After that, we've got Strength. This boosts your physical attack, plain and simple. Now, for arguably the most important two stats, Agility and Luck. Yeah, seriously, Luck. So, the higher your agility is, the more likely it is for you to surprise enemies and get free actions during battles. Your escape rate increases too, and most importantly, you'll act before the enemy party, which can be crucial to surviving some of the game's more challenging bosses. The higher your luck is, the more often you land critical hits, and the more often you dodge status ailments. The critical hits thing is another very important part of this game. When you land a crit, the attack ignores the enemy's defense stat and does like double damage on top of that. It's extremely beneficial and you'll want to be landing them as often as possible. It can win fights for you. You might be wondering how it's even possible to earn enough skill points to actually increase these stats enough. Well here's a really cool and fun thing about Last Bible New Testament that sets it apart from other games. From levels 1 through 19, you earn one stat point each time you level up. Typical shit, that's what you'd expect. But once you reach level 20, you start earning two points per level up. And when you reach level 40, you get three points. At level 60, four points. And at level 80, five points. That means the strength of your human party members quickly starts to snowball until you're a killing machine you do nothing but get exponentially stronger, and considering how often you level up, you're just constantly seeing those numbers go up. It's really satisfying. I love how they did the stats in this game. It's easily one of the most fun things about it, and I think it kind of makes up for the lacking demon gameplay. This, combined with what I said earlier about how the battles feel quicker and snappier, probably because this game was made for playing on the go, and you got yourself a title where incessant random encounters almost feel addicting, and dare I say it, rewarding. While this game might have the general framework of the first Last Bible's mediocre battle system, it feels much better and far surpassed the expectations I had. I think that sums up the game's core mechanics pretty nicely. I'll introduce a few more things as they come, but for now, let's go save Mom. Mora Cave is a short walk to the west. Despite not being able to recruit any help yet, you do pretty well alone in this game, so experiment with some battles and increase your stats. After just a few level ups, you'll learn the healing spell Dia, which greatly increases your survivability if you're worried about it. The cave itself is fairly small, and hey, wait, check out this music! Kind of a cool little theme, right? This game doesn't have a huge soundtrack, but it's solid stuff. Anyway, if you take the upper path here in the cave, you'll find some money and a free healing water. The lower path has a healing spring that recovers your party back to maximum energy. If you're feeling up to it, this is a good spot to grind out some cash for the longsword, which makes the next few zones pretty easy. Up to you. But if you do it, you will be rich quick. If you decide to save up enough money to buy out your entire hometown, good for you. But regardless, go just a bit further in, and we find Mom being held captive by some kind of creature who's groaning about Orichalcum, a power source for demons, which you'll probably remember from the core Last Bible trilogy. His sprite makes you think you're gonna go up against some kind of humanoid devil or something, but in one of the most hilarious boss reveals of all time, he is actually a microscopic bee. Granted, it is a killer bee, but after like two rounds of combat, it was just a stain on the wall. Wow, and there you have it, mom is saved. That's some real hero shit. We revel in our victory for a few seconds and prepare to head back to town when suddenly this mysterious robed woman rolls in. Without saying anything, she bestows our protagonist with the ability to communicate with demons and attaches a summoning computer to our arm, officially unlocking the negotiation feature. But wait, 
she gives us a comp? None of the other Last Bible games had summoning devices. Even Last Bible 3, which had shit like orbital cannons and expansive research facilities. The protagonists of the other games were just able to summon with magic. What fucking time period are we in here? It's very hard to say, but I found that to be one of the most interesting things about this game. You've got all these similarities to the first couple of games, but it isn't clear on how this one could possibly be connected. And then, you get a curveball like this that makes it even less apparent. After giving us the computer, whoever this girl is disappears, and then someone else rushes in, muttering curses about how she escaped their grasp. This is Mephisto. And if you recall, in the original Last Bible, we killed Mephisto, like, twice. This is not some guy you really want to run into in a dark cave. Now, is it the same one? I can't say for sure, but one thing's for certain, we're dealing with another tricky asshole. At first, Mephisto plays it cool, or at least he tries to. He apologizes for his intrusion and says that it's been a long time since he's seen a fellow human. Call it a hunch, but I uh, kinda doubt he's human underneath the majestic robe that conceals his entire face and body. Mephisto then formally introduces himself as a direct subordinate of the Demon Lord and one of his three apostles. So, he's not even shy about being evil in this game. I'm kinda surprised this fucker's still alive, like, you'd think someone as loose-lipped as this about serving the Harbinger of Destruction would have been hanged in Town Square by now. I guess he's just that good. As the conversation goes on, it becomes downright uncomfortable, and the odds of us leaving the cave alive decrease by the second. Mephisto explains that he has come to this planet in advance of the Demon Lord's Awakening to gather Orichalcum. He says that his lord seeks the power of force as he knows the truth behind it and wishes to eradicate both humans who would try to use it as well as another enemy simply referred to as him. Mephisto remarks on how long it's been since he's been able to move his body around so freely and then asks if he could discuss an important topic with us. Yeah, I mean, fuck it man, this is your rodeo, you're running the show here, let's do it. Not like I can just leave. So, his big offer is that we should find Orichalcum for him and give it up to the Demon Lord. Funnily enough, you actually get to make a decision here. So I just said, yeah, sign me up. I'll feed that primordial fuck all the magic rocks he wants. I thought maybe I could blow smoke up his ass long enough to escape the cave. Unfortunately, Mephisto just wanted to see what we would say as a joke, and bluntly states that he'd kill us regardless of our response. Eh, it was worth a shot. After this, Mephisto says, I shit you not, that it's finally dinner time after 100 years, and lunges at us. We're given the chance to put up a pretty worthless resistance, but you know how it goes. After a few turns, he wipes his ass with us, and yeah, our character actually dies. As Mephisto winds up to attack our mom, she's saved at the last minute as Master Vane comes sprinting towards us. Hell yeah, Dad's back from buying milk. He quickly revives us, then sends Mephisto hurling across the tunnel into a wall. Mephisto is shocked to find someone so powerful who would oppose the Demon Lord and vanishes after utterly shitting himself. Vane is glad to see us and our mother, and compliments us for coming here all on our own. He may not have been able to make it to our ceremony, but he obviously showed up where it counted. Back at home, Vane vows to defeat the Demon Lord, but admits that before that happens, the world will face great suffering. He says that we play a critical role in all of this, and must help him to rescue the people of Lagaya and become the Gaia Master that everyone hopes for. After agreeing to what Vane asks of us, he gifts us with a world map, which he claims is special because it came from some group known as the Grand Cross, essentially an army aligned with the Gaia Masters. From here, Vane decides to head back to the headquarters of this Grand Cross organization and has us head northwest to a checkpoint where a priest will grant us access to the lands beyond. 
Before leaving, he suggests we seek out the other two Gaia Master candidates who were selected today. Well, stock up on healing water, buy a couple of items to cure poison if you're feeling saucy, gear up, and we're on the road. Head northwest and we reach a shrine, where the priest there recognizes us as Vane's apprentice and allows us passage. Then we arrive in an entirely new land, Northern Lemuria. To the north of where we start here is a place called Poe Village. Poe Village is extremely, extremely similar to the town in Last Bible where you meet your first party member. There's a monster blocking the only passage into town, and oddly, the place has absolutely no music. If you challenge it, you'll find that it's a fairly powerful phoenix, which has Ajira and Mudo, the latter of which can kill you instantly. You can beat this guy, and you even get a big chunk of money and XP if you do, but afterwards he comes back to life since, well, he's a phoenix. We'll have to leave this place behind for a bit. There's simply no way in at the moment. To the southeast of Poe, through some hills and mountains, you'll find the big city of Lemur. We're bound to find something in here. First thing, as usual, I rested at the inn and upgraded some equipment. There's some armor here that's decently affordable, but the big prize of this town is a Claymore sword, which costs 7,500 maka, but absolutely rips ass if you can get it. If you're smart with money during this first visit to the city, by the time we've wrapped everything else up on this section of the map, you should be able to afford it. And don't worry, that's actually not going to take as long as you might think. The people of the city are heavily fixated on two topics. First, the city's prized orichalcum that had been kept inside of the Grand Temple has been stolen by demons. Bad news. Second, this girl named Alice. Yeah, fucking everywhere you go, they're all talking about this Alice. Considering we named her that, obviously she's our second party member and one of the other guy master candidates, so we're gonna have to track her down. It seems like the entire population has something to say about her. Little kids talk about how strong she is, adults call her a weirdo because of her obsession with beasts, she sounds like a real piece of work. One woman even calls Alice the most famous person in the entire city. Hmm, I wonder if she's gotten any offers for a NordVPN sponsorship. Anyway, we learn that even before the recent uptick in beast activity, Alice would go around hunting for them outside the city, and now, with the Orichalcum missing, she's out in full force looking for the beast who took it. You can even find Alice's house, where her parents are worried sick about her, frustrated with how often she puts herself in danger. Apparently, she's gone off to some place called Mount Larva, all on her own. Over at the temple, we hear about how crusaders were dispatched to the mountain to wipe out the beast there and potentially reclaim the stolen treasure. These crusaders are part of the Grand Cross and help combat the Demon Lord's forces. The highest ranking member of this army is Vayne himself, which is pretty badass. That dude must do everything. We're finally told about an oasis called Uruz to the south which is the very same oasis from the game's opening cutscenes. The waters of Aruz are apparently capable of healing grave wounds and weakening powerful demons. Are you seeing the parallels here again? In the first Last Bible, there was a town with a demon blocking the entrance. It was even positioned in much the same way as the phoenix is in this game. And you needed water from an oasis to get in. Or like retracing the steps of another timeline here or some shit. You might think it sounds like lazy design, like they just wanted a Mega 10 game on cell phones and kind of just rehashed Last Bible and slapped it on there. But I think all of these strange parallels are really important. I think it's hinting heavily at the significance of this story and the grand design of the Last Bible universe. I just haven't figured it out yet. So, a ruse is going to be our next stop. Even though Alice's parents told us that she's headed off to Mount Larva, we learn from some other random villagers that she's actually intended to stop by the oasis first for some of that magic water. Before heading out, we can swing by the temple's inner chamber where we see an empty pedestal where the orichalcum is supposed to be. 
The priests lament that the archangels have not yet descended to aid the city in its time of crisis, and it looks like we're going to be the only ones that can set shit right. Aruz is a ways to the south, around a windy path through some mountains in the desert. Again, almost exactly like Last Bible 1. When we get there, that weird guy who was yelling at the antediluvian horror at the start of the game is still lying on the ground with his skull cracked open. After helping him drink some water from the spring, he thanks us and tells us that his name is Avon the Great Wizard, and starts muttering about how he formed a contract with something that comes from beyond space and time. He then begins to ask us if he's arrived on Lagaya, but suddenly stops as he realizes he somehow knows our name already, and says that we have a cool look about us. Uh, thanks? Avon recognizes the device we're wearing as a comp, and assumes that we've also made some kind of contract with presumably whoever the fuck he's dealing with. He then pulls out a big book and starts flipping through it, and says that its purpose is to automatically chronicle the events of a Chosen One's story, down to the very moment things occur. At some point, this book stopped working like it was supposed to, and Avon realized that it needed to inhabit the same world as the next Chosen One if it was to properly record their story. So he traveled across space and time, like we guessed, to reach our planet and preserve our story for posterity. As he's about to reveal the title of the book, he stops himself and just tells us to think of him as an observer, not someone who's going to help us or harm us. As he puts it, there's no reason to do either of those things because he already knows how the story ends and just wants to see it play out for himself. So this motherfucker is like some kind of interdimensional record keeper or something. I wonder if he was going to say his book is called The Last Bible. Come on, that was probably it. After this absolutely bizarre little exchange, Avon decides to offer us a deal, despite just saying he wasn't going to help us, and asks if we'd do him a favor. To assist him in his research, Avon gives us this demon encyclopedia that allows us to record the stats and moves of enemies we come across. Uh, sure, why not? I rarely look at enemy stats in these games unless it's a boss or something, but I'll give it a shot for our good buddy here. Registering enemies in the encyclopedia works by using an ability called Enroll that Avon gives us. The entries aren't automatically populated just by entering a battle with a new demon. As you go about doing this, you'll be rewarded with additional items and abilities, so there's some incentive if you're feeling up to it. One item you can get actually halves the amount of experience you need to level up, which means you gain power at an absolutely stupid pace but you do need 65 registered demons to get it. And I think the funniest part of this little deal comes at the end, where Avon says the entire process of doing this is actually a pain in the ass, and you can just ignore it if you want to. I guess his focus is on our story, but come on, you gotta be a little more enthusiastic about your studies if you called on some forgotten god to bring you to another world. As the conversation finally starts to die down, Alice suddenly appears and sprints towards the spring, practically running into us and calling us a jerk for standing in her way. Well, nice to meet you too, asshole. She introduces herself as a Gaia Master candidate and hurriedly explains that she's come to grab some of the Oasis water to assist in an ongoing battle at Mount Larva against some powerful demons. Our character doesn't move, which is pretty damn hilarious considering the gravity of the situation, and Alice realizes that we too are a Gaia Master candidate, and that we want to join forces with her. Unfortunately, she dismisses the idea of working together as a total joke, because she's a one-woman circus and doesn't have time to entertain others. She then shoves us out of the way, grabs some Oasis water, and on our way out, suggests we take some for ourselves and revisit Poe to bring down that phoenix. Well, okay. I guess someone's gotta take care of that too, right? I mean, if anything, maybe she'll realize we're actually a cool and sensitive guy with interesting hobbies. So, go all the way back to Poe, splash some of this shit in the bird's face, and it's time for round two. Much easier this time. If you could beat it before, well, you'll beat it even faster now. Hell, you can even set the battle to auto and just watch. 
the phoenix's death magic is being suppressed by the water's magical properties, so there's nothing to worry about. He doesn't revive this time either, after being defeated. Inside the village grounds, everyone sings you praises for getting rid of the demon. There are a few shops here to check out if you really want to, but the big point of getting in here is to talk with a wounded crusader resting in one of the houses. Like everyone else, he's shocked we can pull off bringing down such a magnificent beast, but then admits that it's fitting for a student of Master Vane to kick major ass. He urges us to visit Mount Larva and seek out the Crusader Captain if we want to be of additional use. Alice might want this to be her moment in the spotlight, but this guy makes it clear they can use all the help they can get and they might be in over their heads. All in all, we didn't really get much for doing all this, but it's our duty as a guy of master and all that good shit, so hey, all in a day's work. At least we have the Crusaders to back us up if Alice has a problem with getting in our way again. Mount Larva is far off to the east of Poe. When we make it there, the Crusader Captain initially turns us away, but the guy we just saved assures him of our abilities, and they basically hand this crime scene over to us. The captain says there's a demon up ahead who's grabbed the Orichalcum, and the two step aside and leave us to it. You'll face some stiff resistance as you wander along these mountain paths. It's a very simple dungeon to navigate, but the guys up here eat crack for breakfast and you'll constantly be having your health worn down. The thing is, you're gonna want to recruit a few demons, not even necessarily for fighting or dealing damage, just to catch a few hits and buy you some time. You might need to leave once or twice to resupply if you're unlucky with negotiating, but I think it's pretty important. See, the boss up here doesn't play fair. Check it out. You climb this ladder, and up at the top is Alice, seemingly unconscious, with the Orichalcum lying in front of her. Blocking the way is a gargoyle who declares he'll become a demon king with a power of force, and then attacks us. But he brings a whole fucking squad with him, yeah, five guys total, including him. What kind of shit is that? So, needless to say, you're gonna want some friends to soak up some damage while you get shit done. I'd go for the Harpies on the left first, because they have some pretty annoying spells, but also fall fairly quickly. If you have shitty luck, you might get put to sleep by the Harpies, and at that point, i just smash the monitor and reload to save, you're probably fucked. Once they're down, just focus fire the Mammoth, and then whittle down the gargoyle. A few of the demons up on this mountain have attack spells if you recruit them, but their MP bars are stupidly small. So basically, these guys are like firecrackers. You get to see them do one cool thing, and then they fizzle out. These spells can really help against the harpies if you're having trouble thinning the ranks, but unless you have items to restore MP, your demons will largely be on meat shield duty. When the gank squad goes down, we secure the Orichalcum and wake up Alice, who's surprised we killed the demon. The fuck is everyone so surprised for around here? Do I have to get a tattoo or some shit for people to take me seriously? <sighs> anyway, she says she'll be fine going home alone, and that we better definitely not try to help her out or anything. You know, the whole Sundere shtick. So she's one of these. Well, we'd better head on back to town and make sure she actually gets there. Make your way off this horrible rock, and head towards Alice's house in the city. When we get to her door, we hear her inside arguing with her parents. They're in disbelief that she wants to go on a demon-slaying adventure, and her father urges her to consider the effects this will have on her social status. Alice could give less than a single shit about all of it, says she could never fathom living the normal life, and storms out, running into our weird ass breathing up against her house. This time, she's actually happy to see us, and shyly thanks us for what we did back at Mount Larva. She's curious about the way we fight with demons, and decides to join up with us to see more crazy shit out in the world. See, I knew it. Alice doesn't want to travel with us because of prophecy, or because we're a good friend or something. This girl wants to kill, and we're a catalyst for her to indulge in her dark desires. Trust me, man. I've seen it all. Regardless, we have our first new permanent party member. And look at that, she follows us around on the map like Dragon Quest or something. You may wonder why I even bother pointing that out, but none of the other last Bible games showed more than one party member on the field, so this is some real next-gen high-tech shit. 
Alice isn't really a mage character, which might surprise you because in Mega 10, that's usually what being a girl means. She joins your team at level 5, which is very far behind where we are and kinda sucks, but she starts with 15 agility and 10 vitality and comes equipped with champion gloves. So she's like a boxer or a martial artist, but right now, a little weak. Fresh out of the box, the only thing Alice is really good at is being fast, but she does become an excellent part of the team with time. You're gonna want to focus on leveling up her attack power for obvious reasons, but kick some points towards magic too, because Alice can cast Tarukaja, which buffs your attack, and some other support spells. Once you get the ball rolling and catch her up on levels, what you have is an interesting fast attack character who nicely complements our protagonist's abilities. Stop by the shops if you need to, maybe you want to buy that claymore we talked about earlier, and then visit the temple for our next destination. With the Aura Calcum saved, the priests are extremely thankful and begin discussing a powerful demon presence in the continent of South Lemuria. As they're talking, suddenly, the city's guardians, the four archangels, materialize in the room. Their leader, Michael, approaches us and introduces himself. He says that all across the world, beasts are appearing, and the day of the Demon Lord's Awakening is very close. Michael thanks us for our efforts in defending the Orichalcum and urges us to continue helping those in need, somewhat ominously reminding us that we have to work with the angels if the Demon Lord is to be defeated. Then he bids us farewell, saying that he's headed out to fight some demons himself. The priests, now awestruck at having witnessed the Archangels in person, give us permission to access the warp gate to South Lemuria, and so, our journey continues. Something about that Michael's really fucked up beneath the surface, but we're gonna try and ignore it for now. Strangely, on the way out, if you stay at the inn for a night, you'll have a weird dream about a woman who calls out for our character in Alice, asking how we're liking our new ability to communicate with demons. She makes a comment about how the people of this planet are separated, and then the dream ends without you getting to see what her face looks like. Alice remarks upon waking up that she had the same dream, but she isn't sure of what to make of it, and we just have to continue on. Head on down south, and before long, you'll come across a cave entrance in a beachy area. So actually, it's not just a simple warp to the next continent this time. We actually have to make our way through a cave that's bigger than you might expect. When the priests gave us permission to pass to the next continent, I was thinking like we'd pass through another checkpoint, but no, it's actually spelunking time. I think this is the game's way of making sure Alice is leveled up enough for the next big series of events, but they wouldn't have needed to do this if she just joined your party and matched her level. To be honest though, Alice catches up quick, and there are some items scattered around the dungeon that will boost a chosen party member's stats permanently if consumed. They're referred to as gels, so it sounds like it could be a chewy piece of candy or something. Maybe a gummy bear. Once you're satisfied, track down the stairs and breathe in that fresh southern air. Your immediate surroundings outside of the cave are just mountains and plains as far as the eye can see. We're really out in the fucking sticks now. The only real point of interest is the village of Nod. You remember that shit dump in the first last bible where there were ostriches and stuff running around? Yeah, that's the equivalent here. The town is practically devoid of anything to do, but there's a house near the back where someone apparently neglected to neuter their pets. It's complete cat anarchy. Inside, we meet this wizard boy named Lazelle. We know he's gonna join our party at some point, but right now, just like with Alice, He's less than enthusiastic about that. In fact, the guy's a bit of an oddball. He rightfully opens up the conversation by asking who we even are, to which Alice cheerfully explains that we're Gaia Master candidates traveling the world, even teasing him and asking if he's a fan of ours. Of course, Lazelle is also a Gaia Master candidate, and we're here for his help, but he seems to have a dismissive attitude towards our mission, almost as if it were pointless or misguided. He quickly changes the subject to his father, who has disowned him and works as a priest in another town. Alice continues to prod at Lazelle, essentially asking him how his mind could be occupied by anything other than defeating the Demon Lord, 
but Lazelle grows quiet and says that if we knew why he was disowned and why he truly wanted to be a Gaia Master, we'd call him a freak. Alice then decides to call him some mean names anyway, and we're left with no choice but to continue on from the village. If Lazelle doesn't want to join us yet, we can't make him, but maybe we can get some additional info from his estranged father. From Nod, head southeast past the mountains, and you'll find another warp shrine that brings the party to the Mew continent. Yeah, that's right, we're done with South Lemuria already. We'll be making a return visit pretty soon, but there really isn't much to do there otherwise. Now, the Mew continent turns the shit switch up a few notches. The encounters here are brutal and frequent. Your first dozen or so battles here are gonna be tough, unless you've grinded your dick off. It's a pretty big jump and challenge from where we were five seconds ago. A brief walk to the west leads you to what looks like a fortress called Goljara, where you can resupply and acquire some information. You might consider using Goljara to get over that initial bump in difficulty. Save your game inside, head out, win a fight, come back in and heal up, and just repeat until things level out a bit. This continent is a bit bigger than South Lemuria, and if you end up deep in the wilderness without a strong party, it'll be a miserable experience trying to work your way back to a safe spot. The big topic on everyone's mind in Goljara is the recent sighting of a woman in white who suddenly appeared and began giving people the ability to speak with animals. Sounds like the lady who shoved a computer into my hands without my consent. Some gift. My life's been shit ever since that day. Anyway, the one who knows the most about this ghost is this little boy standing next to his cat, who seems to be having a lot of fun with his new power. He can't teach us the power or anything, but make a mental note of him, because we'll be seeing him again. Aside from this strange business, we learn that to the southwest is a larger city, Gila Nipla, with a big temple we can visit. This is where Lazelle's dad is, and it's another place harboring some orichalcum, so there are bound to be problems. Make your way there, and you'll find that the big city was something of an exaggeration. The only things of note here are some shops and, well, the temple. This is no megalopolis from Last Bible 3, but I guess it's a quaint place regardless. There's some solid equipment available if you got the cash, including a swimsuit for Alice, and an extremely powerful and expensive sword for our protagonist called the Dragon Slayer. If the price of the Dragon Slayer scares you, it's actually possible to get it as a random drop from enemies outside, so pick your poison and make sure you get it, because it's a hefty upgrade that'll serve you well for quite a while. Before heading to the Gila Nipla Temple, be sure to chat up the townsfolk. We learn that there's a place called the Tower of Solomon nearby, as well as a mountain to the northeast called Mount Hormus. Hormus is where you can combine bones you collect in dungeons to create special demons. This is a Last Bible signature special, and you can bet your ass it's useful in this game too. You never have to go here aside from once near the end of the game, so if you're just plowing straight through the story, you might miss out on taking advantage of its full potential. You don't have to look very hard for the bones, by the way. They're just in random chests throughout the game, and odds are, if you're opening every chest you see, you will get what you need. As for the Tower of Solomon, well, that's where Lazelle's dad is. Kidnapped, of course. We come all the way to this damn temple to ask some old fart a question about his freak-ass kid, and he can't even bother to be here. At the other priest's request, we decide to head back to the town of Nod and summon Lazelle for the occasion. Naturally, if the dark forces of this nearby tower can pluck a priest straight from the temple, they can probably also steal the Orichalcum, and that's just not gonna fly. Let's get to it. Retrace your path back towards the shrine that brought us to the Mew Continent, and make sure you stop at Goljara on the way. If you talk to the kid with the cat this time, the woman in white actually makes an appearance confirming that it is the same person who gave us our comp. She stares at us in silence for a few brief moments, and then she walks out, and all of a sudden, we can hear what animals think. I said this in the original Last Bible video, but this power sounds like a living hell. Think about it, you could probably never have a pet again. 
my cats are tearing around the house at three in the morning, you think I want to hear their thoughts screaming through my mind as I try to sleep? And it's not clear how far this goes. If bugs count as animals, then you'll probably never have a moment of silence again for the rest of your life. Those fuckers are in your walls whispering evils at all hours. The cat here is nice to talk with at least, and wonders to itself who the woman in white is. I'm kind of surprised it even cares. Well, back at Nod, we can now speak to the horde of cats outside Lazelle's place, who give us an advance warning that he's not here. Classic shit. And now I lost both of them. What a train wreck. The cats are all shocked to hear that Lazelle's father's been kidnapped, and one of them hands us a black orb, saying that we can use it to find Lazelle, who has apparently wandered off into a cave to perform experiments. Now, despite my instincts warning me against seeking out a shy kid performing experiments alone in the cave, we have to do it, or else this shit show is going to get even further out of hand. The place we're looking for is the Demon Beast Cave, to the northeast of Nod. What a name. The black orb comes into play almost immediately, and is simply used to move a rock out of the way. From there, it's a relatively simple dungeon where you're being mobbed by shit like griffins and mizukis every three seconds. The battles might be snappier here than a lot of other last Bible games, but damn if they don't put you through a lot of fights. When you finally track Lazelle down all the way in the back of the cave, he's performing an ancient dark ritual so disgusting I can't even say it on YouTube. Nah, actually, he's just fusing demons. Yeah, not so bad after all. Of course, since places like the Cathedral Shadows don't exist in this game, and nobody else is out there fusing demons, this comes as quite a shock to Alice, who knows more about killing beasts than squishing them together. Oddly, as Lazelle utters his magic words to perform the spell, he uses the language of the old gods seen in Lovecraft's Call of Cthulhu story, which perhaps adds a bit of a more disturbing element to the whole charade. To be honest, I don't have a problem with it, but once Lazelle notices us, he freaks out, exclaiming that this is his vision for using Gaia. He then sends the newly fused monster at us and runs away, afraid that we're going to tell everyone about what he's been up to. It's just a skeleton, so no sweat. After the dust settles, we return to Nod for the final time to confront Lazelle about what just happened. Oh yeah, and uh, that whole thing about his dad. Alice goes on the offensive immediately, scolding Lazelle for panicking and attacking us. She says that his fusion experiment looked interesting, and that she wasn't going to hurt him, she just wanted to know more about it. Lazelle starts to open up after this, thankful that we're showing genuine interest in his research instead of just fearing it. It's clear that he views Gaia entirely differently than just about everyone else in the world, and I think that's a neat plot element going against this tradition that essentially is the world's reason for existing. Heroes rise up and use Gaia to kill beasts, following that same cycle over and over forever. That's what the planet of Lagaia is. Even if Lazelle's magic did something objectively beneficial, like turn the demon lord friendly, he'd probably still be met with fear and anger from everyone. It just doesn't mesh with how the cycle is supposed to go. His efforts to understand this prescribed enemy in a new way are quite literally contrary to the established nature of existence. In fact, speaking of Lagaya's history in the nature of existence, Lazelle has his own opinions on that too. The conversation begins to shift away from fusing demons as the music becomes mysterious and foreboding, and Lazelle very seriously says that he believes something is wrong with this world. He asks us if we know the history of the planet, to which Alice responds with what you'd expect. There's a 100 year cycle, the Archangels descend, the Demon Lord's defeated. Lazelle seems to think that this story's strangeness illustrates itself. Why would the Demon Lord wait 100 years every single time? Why hasn't he ever come sooner than that? Why not later? Where do the Archangels even come from? Obviously, we have nothing to say back to him, we don't know that shit. The cycle's just the way it is, and considering we've seen the angels, we at least know they're not made up. Lazelle just keeps going, 
asking us if we know where the beasts that have been appearing come from, how they're born. There are so many unknowns with this story that's existed for all of time, and it just doesn't sit right with him. He has some good points, and it's likely that anyone else who bothered asking about this kind of thing was either exiled or done away with. Sounds like we're gonna have to unravel quite the conspiracy. I really found all of this a lot of fun to read through. This game has an odd, sinister atmosphere to it, almost like it's repeating a lot of the events of the first last Bible to trick you into letting your guard down, as if you've already got the whole thing figured out. Well, believe me, unless you already know exactly how this game ends, you just won't fucking guess it. It's that bizarre, but all in due time. After all that talking, we decide that now is a good moment to tell Lazelle that his dad's been kidnapped. He gets pissed off and asks us why we didn't just tell him that earlier, and then runs off to Solomon's tower alone to save him. This is one of those moments you just replay over and over in your head in the shower a few months later, and just beat yourself up over it like, damn, why didn't we just tell him about his dad first instead of all that other shit? Oh well. It's finally time for a little rescue mission. Head on back to where Gila Nipla was, then head northwest up into a snowy area where you'll see the tower sitting on its own little piece of land with a bridge connecting to it. Solomon's Tower is a multi-floor dungeon that is incredibly short, but also incredibly dangerous if you're unprepared. The size of each floor is minuscule, but the demons in here are beefed the fuck out, and you can't seem to recruit any of them. This is another spot where if you're having a hard time, the solution is just gonna have to be grinding for a bit. Stock up on curatives from a nearby settlement, then wander over, fight monsters on the first floor until you can't do it anymore, and repeat as necessary. I'd recommend your level to be in the low to mid 20s for the boss. And if you want an interesting demon to add to your team, wander around outside until you find this guy, Arkenny. For some reason, he has 66 luck, which is incredibly high. That's one lucky dude, and hopefully, he'll score you some extra critical hits. When you're all leveled up and ready to go, head to the top of the tower, and you'll see Lazelle wounded on the ground next to his father, with a demon blocking the way. You want to guess who it is? You already know. Come on, say it. I'm serious. Say it. It's this asshole again. Of course, a minotaur in a tower. Just like in Last Bible 1. Just like in Digital Devil Story. Or you know what? Just like every game I play. Who the hell keeps doing this? Ugh. At least he had the decency to wear some clothes this time, I guess. Minotaur can hit hard with that big axe mace thing he's carrying, but if you've got a full team with healing capabilities, it's gonna be hard for him to outdamage you, especially if you spent time raising your level. If you're having issues keeping him under control, he's actually vulnerable to sleep magic, so exploit that as often as you need to. That's a pretty interesting thing about this game now that I think about it. Bosses aren't exempt from status effects. It's never a waste of time to experiment and see which ones might work. After the fight wraps up, Lazelle and his father head back to the temple at Gila Nipla, and we follow suit. We're met with applause and thanks by the priests, and then the Archangels make another appearance. Michael thanks us again for protecting the city's Orichalcum, and apologizes that he couldn't be of more direct use to us in defeating the demons. He explains that they've been hard at work in constructing the Ark, which we'll have to use to defeat the demon lord in his palace on the moon. Michael urges us to keep up the fight, but before he and the other angels take their leave, Lazelle interrupts him with a question which humiliates his father. He asks where the angels go when they're not here, and why the demon lord only returns after 100 years have passed, even going as far as to say that it feels like an imaginary story. That's gonna take some balls to say that straight to Michael's face. The dude's practically an alien to these people, considering they don't even know where he comes from. Michael simply says that the angels awake in this land when the time is right, and that they don't know why the demon lord takes 100 years to revive. Then they disappear. In the aftermath, Lazelle basically destroys his relationship with his father. As his dad stands there, stammering in shock at how offensive that must have been to the angels, 
Lazelle asks if he's going to say something or if he's just impersonating a chicken and then gets double disowned. Our guy has some jokes up his sleeve, doesn't he? With his father now out of the picture forever and a mind full of questions, Lazelle at last decides to join the team and see if he can get to the bottom of what the Archangels are hiding. With him on our side, we now have an excellent healer who is also capable of using the extremely powerful Ronka line of spells, seen in the other last Bible games. These take multiple turns to cast, but deal insane damage, and when used properly, can trivialize difficult bosses. If that wasn't enough, we can also fuse demons now whenever we want. Nice. From here, the only thing left to do to make any sort of progress is to head south where you'll find this town called Pacifist. We're kind of like between story arcs right now. This place is a port town, and we need to help out with a quick problem so we can use a boat and get to the next major act. While you're wandering around town, I'd recommend stopping in the weapons shop and buying a Dragon Fang for Alice to use. It's another solid weapon, and it doesn't really break the bank this time. So, the big issue with this place is that the mayor's son ran off to a nearby cave infested with monsters and took a crimson staff along with him. The mayor offers to let us use one of his ships to reach the Grand Cross headquarters in exchange for saving his son and getting the staff back. He provides another ship for the time being that takes us to this cave out at sea, but we don't get to control it or anything, so it's essentially just being warped straight to the dungeon. This is just another demon beast cave, like the one Lazelle was in. Not much to say about it really other than the obvious. You're gonna want to raise Lazelle's level, he joins you pretty weak. Explore thoroughly and try to keep him alive. There's a healing spring you can camp out next to and just grind to your heart's content if that's what you want to do. Just make sure you're not letting him fall behind. The boss at the end of this stage is none other than Cerberus, who goes down pretty fast, but then joins your party as a powerful level 40 demon. Fuck yeah. Wake up the mayor's kid, and he thanks us for the help, assuring us that he could have handled this all by himself. Dude, your ass was knocked out on the floor. Anyway, the kid grabs the staff, and we all head back. The mayor thanks us, lets us keep the staff, and gives us permission to use his other ship, which brings us to the Grand Cross base, where we can receive our next orders now that we've assembled all the Gaia Master candidates. All in all, sort of a weird, inconsequential little mission, but it does serve to get you acquainted with Lazelle's abilities, and we got a free Cerberus out of it. I feel like most of the payoff for this segment actually comes in the form of a dialogue amongst the party that happens afterwards. On the way out, Lazelle comments on how friendly the mayor was with his kid, even despite all the trouble he got himself into, and reflects on how he could never get along with his own father. Alice finds common ground with him in this, and the two ask about our dad, to which you can choose whether or not the protagonist likes Master Vane. I'm not trying to say the game just got all crazy emotional for a second, but I didn't expect him to throw in a little bit about how some people just can't have a good relationship with their parents, and it's not even their fault. I love how this game spends more time developing the party's friendship. While a lot of the content we're seeing is mirrored in some way in Last Bible 1, it feels far more fleshed out in this game, and it's cool. The heroes feel more like people in this game, which really surprised me. Hop on the next ship, and we're whisked away to a small piece of land outside of the Grand Cross HQ. Inside, a man in golden armor named Goliath greets us. Goliath is in charge of things here, and tells us that he's Master Vane's number one disciple. Rather than send us three out on another mission, he decides that we need to pass a training exercise. He wants us to make it through the entire headquarters where everyone within, including him, will be hostile to us. Holy fuck. Goliath goes on to say that we're not permitted to continue with our Gaia Master duties unless we make it through this, and then retreats far into the building, waiting to see if we can even make it that far. And so, it's dungeon time yet again. The Grand Cross HQ is jai fucking gigantic. It's not hard to navigate, it's just huge. 
massive hallways with a grueling encounter rate as always. You'll be attacked by a wide variety of soldiers, from mages to assassins to just plain old fighters. With Cerberus' help and upgraded equipment, you should be okay, but you're going to be healing after every battle and relying on those level ups to restore your MP. Goliath himself is frighteningly powerful and can cast group targeting attack spells that deal significant damage as well as dish out physical attacks that are likely to bring any demons you have close to death. The best strategy is to have Alice cast Tarukaja to boost your team's attack and then get Lazelle to cast Ronka. If you can make it through a couple of turns and pull that off, Goliath will be heavily weakened and you should be able to finish it from there. But as you can see, I only barely managed to beat him with Alice having just 8 HP remaining and Cerberus with only 2. A little bit of luck might be involved here. After passing this crazy ass test, Goliath says he'll instruct the soldiers to the east to let us through and reminds us that the Crusaders are aligned with the people of Lagaya in defending the planet. Head east over the newly unlocked bridge, and after a brief hike, you'll find another fortress-like settlement called Doma. We learn here that there's a warp shrine to the south that'll bring us to the continent of Atlantis, if we so desire. And if we stay at the inn, the party experiences a shared dream of the woman in white. She remarks that we're stronger than ever, and says that the people of Lagaya have fallen for a false narrative surrounding the planet's history, constructed by a mysterious him. You might remember Mephisto mentioning this him way back at the start. Unfortunately, we don't get any context on who it is, but at least this all confirms Lazelle's suspicions about what we're fighting for. Aside from this, Doma is just a little cozy resupply checkpoint. There's an optional cave you can explore to the north where you can defeat an Orthrus and have it join your party. I'd highly recommend doing so, but beyond that, you're clear to just head to the Atlantis War Point. The shrine is heavily guarded by Crusaders, and upon arriving in Atlantis, some of them tell us that there's a Grand Cross encampment nearby, as well as a large city called Acropolis and a smaller settlement called Tyrus. For now, the Grand Cross camp is blocked off. A crusader protects the entrance and just won't let us in, saying that entry is prohibited. So I guess we'll check out Acropolis to the west. This is the final big city and the last place housing a temple with Orichalcum. This one might be my favorite. It feels kind of lavish in comparison to the others. There's even an area with indoor shops and a big grand carpet. It's pretty cool, like some kind of medieval fantasy mall or something. There's plenty of equipment to buy, lots of great items, and of course, gossip to hear. For starters, we learn that the city has an underground waterway that connects all the way to Tyrus. We also find out from the priests that the Ark we'll be using to go to the moon is being constructed by a guy named Fram, who has apparently been shut into his home for quite a while. As we're discussing the Ark, the Archangels materialize yet again. Michael warns that the Demon King's resurrection is quickly approaching, and the priests tell him that something is wrong with Fram. He's not just shut into his home because he's busy, he flat out won't leave his room. His place is over at Tyrus, and nobody can persuade him to open the door. There's nobody who can replace Fram as the builder, so something needs to be worked out. Michael provides literally no help with this, and says that he hopes we can figure it out, and then leaves to continue working on his end of the project. I love that. Well, there is one way we can get into Fram's house. We're gonna sneak in through his fucking toilet. Yeah, there's an entrance to the waterways in the city, and we know it connects to Tyrus. Head over, kill the demons that are for some reason guarding the entrance, and then it's time for some real plumber ass shit. The waterways are another sizable dungeon, kind of like the Grand Cross HQ. You're not going to get lost, but you might get pissed off because it takes a while to get through. Part of the way through the dungeon, you actually end up behind the walls of the temple where you can eavesdrop on a conversation being held by the Archangels. Why are they here? Why didn't they just have this conversation over in Angel Land? 
I don't know, but they fucked up this time, and we hear some juicy shit. First, they're looking for a woman. I'm sure you can guess who that is. Second, they're shit-talking Lizelle for asking them crazy questions, and apparently have great difficulty with coming up with excuses for not answering them. The angels essentially admit that they stick to a script when talking to us, and kind of just insist on their own power without explaining much else. They talk about the Demon Lord and his potential acquisition of the power of force, and then disappear after saying that there are still risks with their plan. Strange stuff, am I right? After crawling tooth and nail through the sewers and losing your sanity to encounters every half step, you'll eventually emerge in Fram's room, where a demon stands next to a dining table. This is not Mr. Fram. It's Dolahan, a very angry demon who holds his head in his hands instead of wearing it normally. He, uh, dies extremely quickly and tells us that the real Fram is at the Grand Cross encampment. Lizelle realizes there's something really not right about that, and so we unlock the door and book it out of Tiris, creating a strange scene as a group of people just blast forth from Fram's locked workshop. Nobody will ever know the lengths we went through to get in there. Back at camp, the guard at front is as stubborn as ever, but this time, Lazelle tells the dark forces at play here to reveal themselves, and what do you know, we have to fight a second Dolahan. This whole place is under the influence of demons, and our asses basically missed it. This is pretty much Grand Cross HQ 2.0. It looks much the same, and plays much the same. Big hallways, constant fights, and a tough boss waiting for you at the end. The one behind these dark illusions, and the true reason Fram was nowhere to be seen, is Belil, another of the three disciples of the Demon Lord. Belil seems surprised that there are three of us coming against him, and acknowledges that we're second only to Master Vane. Regardless, he gives it his best and tries to take us out. This is one tough guy. I had more trouble with him than Goliath. He has over 4,000 HP, can heal himself if he wants to, and can deal over 700 damage to a unit with an attack he likes to use. Your best shot here is to try and put him to sleep with Dormeen or confuse him with Tentarafu. His resistance to these status effects is moderate, but it can be pulled off if the RNG is with you. I managed to beat this fight without exploiting those, but it's hard. You'll really want to make sure Lazelle has high agility at this point. He needs to be the one taking action first every round so that he can heal before Belial attacks again. As long as you're first to the draw, you can do it, but it takes some time, and depending on how your luck goes, you're probably going to have a few close calls. After he's out of the way. Fram thanks us, saying that the demons wanted him to build an ark for them. He warns us that another group of demons is going to make an attack on yet another Grand Cross base, and that we'd better intercept it before it's too late, handing us a small Grand Cross amulet to get inside. He then runs off to complete his ark for the angels, or, well, us, and we're left to it but not before he snaps at Alice for referring to him as uncle during the conversation. Okay, well, time for another Grand Cross fuckfest. This time it's to the southeast and then back up, all the way around these mountains. Walk in and look who it is! It's Bale, the final disciple, standing right at the front door. He says we're too late, and then launches into an attack after Alice demands to know what he's done with the Crusaders. Bale's a little less hard this time. I cleared him on my first attempt. He's got powerful spells, but he's not quite as vicious as Belial, lacking a decent physical attack. Provided you keep up consistent healing, and maybe bring along some Gaia drops to ensure you don't run out of MP, you'll be alright. Taking a couple losses like I did here is fine, as long as your key fighters are constantly in play. When he falls, Alice makes fun of him for having a big mouth and little to back it up, and Bale kind of starts to go nuts, entering a laughing fit as he assures us that we'll find no less than a mountain of corpses inside. 
Sure enough, the place is littered with fallen crusaders, as well as demons to fight. Yep, it's like the 17th dungeon that looks like this. They sure like these Grand Cross gauntlets. And there's nothing really new to talk about. It's a bit shorter at least, just walk from room to room until you reach the end. You'll come across a door where you can hear people talking within. A voice asks another if it's even human, claiming that they possess Gaia to rival the Demon Lord. And that can only mean one thing. It's Master Vane, standing over Bale, who apparently managed to get in here and attack him? I kind of thought he died out on the porch? Maybe I accidentally clicked through some kind of box of dialogue that cleared that up. Regardless, he's definitely dying this time, but he seems to have shaken Vane to his core, having revealed to him the truth of the planet's history. Vane is struggling to shake off whatever Bale said before we got here, and Bale continues to taunt him about it, asking him if the truth makes him feel good. Finally, he fades away, and Vane only barely acknowledges us, saying that he needs to go and rest for a little bit. What kind of crazy shit does he know? Oh well, I mean, I guess we'll find out soon enough. Venture back to Acropolis after all this, and the Archangels announce that the airship is at last complete. But, the day has come. Yeah, the Demon Lord is awake now. Michael says that the worldwide assault on all of the Grand Cross bases was a diversion, and the Orichalcum has successfully been stolen from all of Lagaya's temples, basically undoing all the work we've done up to this point. While we were successful in beating back a whole horde of his demons, as well as two high-ranking disciples, the Demon Lord has what he wants, and Mephisto is still alive to help him. Michael lets us know that Master Vane has returned to our hometown to rest, and says that we've proven ourselves in all regards to do this job. We need to bring down the Demon Lord and get the Orichalcum back. Now is our best shot to pull it off. The ship's waiting outside, and our asses are going to the moon. Compared to Last Bible 1, the thing looks way more futuristic. Like, this is a starship. It's not just some wooden airship. It's almost kind of weird how out of place it looks in this game. Alright, well, I mean, this is it. What we've worked so hard up to this point to get ready for, the big showdown, the completion of the cycle, are we gonna find out the truth behind all this shit? Let's see what we can do. Hop on board, and there's a couple stops we can make before the great journey. First, Mount Hormus. If you have demon bones, head on over there and see if you can create any special zombie demons. Then, fly south of Acropolis, and you'll find Mount Gushna, where you can convert any zombie bone demons you have into fully living creatures by paying some money and handing over some magnetite, which is just another item in this game you'll find randomly for this specific purpose. If you have Orthrus and Cerberus, you can also fuse them into Soleon at Mount Gushna, which is highly, highly recommended. This is a demon you'll have with you to the end of the game. Once you're all prepped and ready to go, you'll want to look for an eagle geoglyph, but not this one next to our house. There exist two in the world map, and the one we want to go to is near Doma. This one whisks us out into the planet's atmosphere, headed towards the moon. As the crew rests within the ship, they have one of those really deep conversations that only occur at 3 in the morning during a sleepover. Lazelle can't believe we're really going to go do this, and asks us if we're scared, to which I replied, yes, because I can only imagine the anxiety just sitting on this ship, seeing the moon get closer, and knowing what's coming. It's part of the prophecy that we win, but still. Alice remains quiet, and Lazelle teases her, asking if she can hear the Demon Lord. She shows a different side of herself and says that she's dreading the upcoming fight, because after it's over, we all just have to go back to our normal lives. If you think about how poorly all of our friends have had things go with their parents, it makes total sense why they wouldn't want to go back to that shit. The group eventually slips off into sleep, where the woman in white pleads with us to listen well, as no time remains. She tells us that there's another figure we should be worried about. The creator of Lagaya's history. The one who governs all of the universe. She nearly reveals his name, and then, 
the dream fades. Could she mean God? I mean, that's gotta be what him has been referring to. Or could it be somebody else? Well, no time to figure it out. Sleepy time's over, our asses are on the moon. Step out and breathe in that cold space vacuum, we're up on this shit without spacesuits and doing just fine. From where you start, you can actually see where you need to go. It's this crimson crystal palace, but getting there is easier said than done. The moon is a bizarre dungeon where walking to one side very quickly loops you around to the other, and it's difficult to tell exactly where that boundary is because of all the rocks. The map is actually a lot smaller than you'd think, and there are only a couple paths to the palace that work. It's just trial and error really. Try out all possible paths, and you'll find the one, all the while beating back shit like, uh, mermaids. Yeah, moon mermaids. You ever see one? There's a healing spring right outside the palace if you want to do some last minute grinding before you go in. Nice of them to put that here for us. Charge the front door and Mephisto appears, welcoming us to Pandemonium, the demon lord's lair. Lazelle demands to know the truth told to Master Vane, but Mephisto has no time for us, only saying that the demon lord will claim the power of force before attacking us. Round two with this guy. I think we can handle it this time. Mephisto's got some skills, like Madoon, that can flat out just kill you instantly, but he's also got a critical weakness, a mere 20% resistance to having his magic sealed. Nail him with a sealing spell, and the fight becomes incredibly easy. With barely more health than Bale or Belial, he's definitely the weakest link, and puts up only moderate resistance before going down. Alright, it's time to hit up Pandemonium, let's finish this shit. As you'd expect, the Demon Lord's palace is sprawling and grand. Lots of staircases and potential paths to take, and a barrage of fresh enemies to work through, including some that can paralyze, which is very dangerous. As you work your way higher and higher, you'll come across a zombified Mephisto who also spams paralysis magic at you. Like seriously, he uses it almost every turn. If you have someone wearing equipment that makes you immune to being paralyzed, I mean, there's basically no fight. If not, it's probably one of the most annoying in the entire game. It's odd to be sure, but once you beat this, the dungeon is nearly over. The Demon Lord stands waiting at the apex of a very large staircase, with the Orichalcum arranged behind him. He acknowledges our arrival, and Lazelle immediately calls out for him, urging him to listen. Lazelle explains his doubts about the Archangels and the history of Lagaya, which seems to surprise the Demon Lord, who admits that this has all been a machination of him. For thousands of years, this has all just been the same endless show, and the Demon Lord is stuck in it with no way to break free other than perhaps the power of force. While the Demon Lord thought gathering the Orichalcum would grant him this power according to ancient legend, the woman in white apparently contacted him and explained that the power of force is simply innate to certain people. With little hope of breaking free of this cruel eternal cycle, the Demon Lord launches into a rageful attack to drive us away, revealing his name to be Lucifer. Kinda saw that coming. So here he is, the Big L, the man himself. We have a mountain of health to work through. Over 9,000. Your best bet is to spam poison spells on him until it works, because that deals hundreds of damage per turn, and is essentially like having two extra party members hitting him for you. Lucifer has powerful attacks, some of which can be sealed if you're lucky. One of his moves, an energy blast, hits everyone for pretty good damage, and another, Angel Dust, can be used regardless if he's been sealed, so you're never truly safe in this fight. It can be hard to pull off with all the healing you'll need to be doing, but the Ronka spells are great for knocking big pieces off of his health bar. If you have Soleon, she's actually capable of casting Ronka herself, which is pretty crazy, so make good use of it. After a very long fight, Lucifer gives in, but with all of these unanswered questions left, I'm sure you know, things aren't over yet. 
As the fight ends, Lazelle calls out our name, and Lucifer remarks that he remembers it from a conversation with the woman in white, who he calls the goddess. She implied we were the only ones capable of helping him escape the cycle. Then he turns to stone, floats off screen, and splits into nine pieces which are scattered around Lagaya. It's a victory, but doesn't really feel like one. In fact, it kind of sounds like we fucked up. Recovering the stolen orichalcum, we return home, where Michael graciously thanks us for what we've done. He says that the future of Lagaya has been secured, and that all of the people watched our return on the Ark. We've successfully added yet another page to the endless story of this planet's heroism. After that, a party breaks out. The townspeople come to the temple, and everyone young and old congratulates and thanks us for saving the day. It's honestly a really great and oddly tense scene. You know the angels are up to some fuck shit, and there's really nothing satisfying about what we just did. Sure, we killed the demon lord, but he was only fighting us because he had to. It's almost like both you and the angels are kind of playing nice for the public, and you're both suspicious of each other as you walk around the room and shake hands with people. After talking with everyone, things start to calm down, and Michael urges us to get some rest. Of course, Lazelle can't keep his mouth shut about what we heard from Lucifer, and asks Michael about the true history of Lagaya being an illusion. Michael's response is to break out into disturbing laughter, which I think makes the party collectively shit themselves a little bit. He then reassures us that the story we've been told by Lucifer is all nonsense to confuse humans, and that the woman in white we've seen in our dreams is just part of the demon's plan to get us on their side. Michael says it's good that we have a strong imagination, but that we shouldn't be susceptible to the words of a demon, and then sends us on our way asking if we'd return the orichalcum to Gila Nipla and Lemur on foot. No airship allowed. Apparently, it's a holy relic only to be used in the battle against Lucifer. Yeah, you know what, sure. We'll use that excuse to justify the torture I'm about to endure. Our asses really have to walk all the way back to these old locations. Ugh, whatever. Let's do it. We'll call it a world tour for one super awesome victory on the moon. We'll leave the city, we're in Acropolis by the way, and head east to the shrine. Then go clear back to the first Grand Cross headquarters where we trained with Goliath. Take the boat back to Pacifist, then start the walk to Gila Nipla to the north. When we arrive at the city expecting the welcome wagon, the entire place is dead silent. There's nobody outside. All the doors are locked, except for the temple. Inside, we see Lazelle's father flanked by two crusaders. Lazelle excitedly greets him, but Old Dad immediately shuts him down, sharply saying that the town was evacuated because they heard we were coming. Lazelle then gets disowned for the third time, as his father says he's acting under the influence of the devil and sends five mages at us. They go down easily, they are just human guards after all. But afterwards, we have no choice but to book it out of the temple and flee the town entirely unless we just want to massacre the town's population. What the fuck is going on? After a long trek to Lemur, it's the same story. The place is another ghost town, and in the temple, we're accosted yet again. This time, Alice's father is the one waiting for us. Alice pleads with him to listen as we've defeated Lucifer and are here on the angel's orders, but her dad insists we're lying and that the angels have told him a different story. Fucking Michael. That bullshit about the airship was just so he could spread some kind of lie about us to each of the cities before we got there. We're asking too many existential questions, and he wants our asses out of the picture. Honestly. If he's got the whole world turned against us, he might get that pretty soon. This time we're up against five soldiers, pretty much nothing to it, but then we lose access to this city too. Alice demands that we head to Norn to see if the story is spread there, and what's waiting for us is easily among the game's most difficult challenges. Just like the rest, our hometown is eerily quiet. In the temple stands Master Vane, alone, faced away from us. 
He takes a moment before speaking, then greets us, saying that it's been a while. He reflects on his initial words to us before we left town for the first time. He asked us to promise to always help the people of Lagaya. Then, he coldly says that we are all just living in a sweet lie, and lunges at us, determined to take us down for the sake of the planet. Shit. This fight is cuckoo crazy mode. Vayne uses a move called Master Blade very frequently that deals 7 or 800 damage on up to two members of your team. It's fucked up. If that hits your main healers, I mean, that's it. You're gonna snowball out of control. You can put Vayne to sleep, but the thing is, you're gonna have to attack him anyway, so you'll just wake back up before long. This dude will mess you up if you aren't at the absolute top of your game. You have to have quick party members, multiple people who can heal and revive those who die, and you have to hope you don't just get blown away with that insane blade every round. Vayne sent my ass to the title screen time and time again. I managed to pull through by the absolute skin of my teeth. Only Alice was alive, and I had her putting Vayne to sleep, punching him in the face, and just repeating that over and over, slowly being worn down myself all the while. If you can pull this off, the vast majority of the game's remaining bosses pale in comparison. Seriously. As Vayne lies defeated, he tells us we're really strong, and bitterly remarks that the meaning of his entire life has been shattered. He says that he doesn't deserve to be called our father, and regrets turning his sword towards us, essentially saying he has no idea what's real anymore, and he just doesn't know what to do. Michael then appears and finishes him off, but not before Vayne hands us his lucky sword. Then, crusaders rush into the temple, and well, what do you think this looks like? We're holding Vayne's sword over his own dead body. Michael just says we murdered him, and then they all gang up on us. Vayne giving us his special sword was a bittersweet moment, but he kind of fucked us there too. As you can see, the game doesn't even have the courtesy to heal you or let you save before going against Michael. And if you think that's unfair, well, it is, because you can't win the battle. It's a mandatory failure, and it really did scare the shit out of me for a second after all the trouble I went through to get past Vayne. You can put up resistance for a couple turns, but you won't survive. Just as it looks like things are really over, and Michael has succeeded in hiding the secret of the world, the woman in white appears, who urges the party to fly. She warps us to a spot where the airship's being held, and we all jump inside, following the woman as she flies across the ocean. Michael, absolutely enraged, chases the ship, which looks pretty funny, and the woman leads us to a hidden portal on an obscure island that brings us to the city of Eden, the realm of the goddess. This strange place is populated by friendly demons who have become enlightened. They don't care about what happens in the outside world and don't have the desire to kill anymore. They even have some shops here we can visit for equipment, which, if you think about it, doesn't make much sense. It'd be like if there was a gun store in heaven. The shopkeeper does explain that these weapons were forged with the help of the goddess to assist us in ushering in a new era, but it's still kind of funny. So, yeah, the woman in white really is the goddess of Lagaya. She tells us she has no name, but that people refer to her as the reincarnation of the goddess. You know what that means, right? People call her Megami Tensei. I'm dead fucking serious. Alice even flat out says it. I've never seen another game in the franchise just flat out name drop it that hard like that. And then, Megami Tensei gets into the crazy shit. The mystery starts to get unraveled. The rest of the game from here on out is absolutely just batshit. Check it out. The goddess tells us that since the beginning of the universe, one known as the Great Will has existed. She chooses who will function as this being, and then this god establishes a system to maintain balance for the entirety of their rule. They control everything for a long time, hundreds of millions of years, but not forever. And now, the time is coming for the current god's term to end. She says that amongst highly intelligent forms of life, 
Those who exhibit the most harmony will be chosen to reincarnate into omniscient beings when the time for the generational shift arrives. And the goddess believes that we are such a person. Then she starts talking more about the selection process. It seems that we were calculated as the best fit for the role far in advance, so far that we wouldn't be born for quite a long time, and a proxy needed to be chosen before our turn would arrive. Given the continual cycle of destruction that Lagaya faces, this proxy was a poor choice, but the angels support him, and so the goddess went into hiding here in Eden a sort of alternative dimension where she waits for the true successor to be born. So, the cycle of the Demon Lord is absolutely pointless. It only exists to maintain an eternal status quo. And the endless conflict the planet faces is just because the god running things right now isn't that good at his job, and apparently couldn't think of a better gimmick for the universe. The angels wanted to hide that shit because they're heroes for as long as the cycle continues, and if we find out the truth, we might grow powerful enough to dethrone the current god and ruin the control they've held for so long. Alice realizes that the goddess here is the same one who told Lucifer the truth about everything, hence why he already knew our name. She's been making moves to upset the cycle, and this time, it might work. Lazelle is dismayed at the truth, questioning why an all-powerful god would waste his power on creating a cycle of violence instead of perpetual peace. However, the goddess says that the amount of good and bad that exists in the universe is fixed, and God has to do his best to balance those where he can. Where he went wrong is robbing humans of the ability to choose their fate. The cycle ensures that no choices are made, it's just the same thing repeated forever, which just isn't fair. The goddess tells us again that we, are the qualified person. This story can be ours. And while she may have chosen a less than stellar god before, we can still make things right. She urges the party to rest at Eden and think over the decision. After all, she wants a world where people are free to make choices, so we can't be forced into the role ourselves. The party's basically at a loss for words. I don't think there is a proper way to react to all that information, to be fair. Alice reflects on how she used to be so much more carefree before this adventure, and Lazelle says that he couldn't fathom becoming God. He's happy that we've finally reached the truth we've been searching for all this time, but that doesn't make it any easier to accept. Alice asks if we're sure we can handle what the goddess is asking us, and you're free to choose yes or no. I decided to be confident with it and proceed boldly onward. After returning to the goddess with our decision, she gives us our new mission. With access to the airship, we're to travel the world and recover the nine fragments of Lucifer, then return them here. After that, we can use the geoglyph deep in the mountains near our house to visit another moon where the archangels have a base. Okay, well, we really do have to travel the entire fucking world and look for these nine fragments. If you know where to look, it's not so bad, since we can fly, but some of these fragments, in my opinion, are placed in evil locations that take forever to figure out, so I'm gonna tell your ass where all nine of them are. Number one, right next to the entrance to Eden. Very easy. Then, you got one on Mount Hormus, and one on Mount Gushna. After picking up three fragments, no matter where you find them, you're attacked by the Archangel Uriel, who's actually not very hard to bring down. Compared to Vayne, at least, it's a cakewalk. You can even paralyze Uriel with magic, which is kinda crazy. After this, there's a fragment at Mount Larva, one in the snow near Lemur, and one to the east of Gila Nipla. After you pick up six fragments, you're ambushed by Raphael. Again, an easy fight. You should have a couple party members with the move Stardust by now. Spam that shit to bring down Raphael's helpers, then, just fight an average difficulty boss, and move on. Finally, we have a fragment to the southeast of Acropolis, and then, one on an island to the west of Nod. The last one is the most stupid, and is all the way at the back of the Demon Beast Cave near Nod. You have to walk back through the entire dungeon, and it's right at the end. 
that's kind of cruel, man. I don't know. Quite the obscure spot, if you ask me. After finding the last piece, Gabriel appears and realizes that the doors to Eden are currently left unprotected since we're not there anymore. Instead of fighting us like the others, he makes a 4D chess move calculation and decides to just run to Eden and kill the goddess. And what do you know? His ass does it. He beats us there and kills the goddess. You fucking dickhead. Gabriel's not much tougher than his colleagues, it's basically the same fight we've already done twice. Whip out that Stardust move, clear out the trash mobs, and then just wail on him until he goes down. There's not much to be afraid of here. I don't really think it's fair that this dork-ass Archangel can kill the goddess who chooses God, but he did. In her final moments, she bestows us with the goddess bracelet, which protects the wearer against basically all status effects, and the force sword, which is extremely powerful. Then, she commands the fragments of Lucifer to assemble, and dies, satisfied with her extremely long life. Alright, well, our last goal is to strike the heavens. We don't have much left to lose. Now, before you go, Lucifer isn't with us yet. He needs a bit more time to incubate or some shit like that. To gain access to him as a party member, you need to fight 10 random battles and then return here. Kind of weird, but once you've done this, he stands waiting, saying that if we want to take down the creator, our goals are aligned and joins up with us. Lucifer hopes that after the fight is over, he can cease existing entirely, which is uh, kind of sad, but I also kind of get it. I mean, he's been at it for a long time. Lucifer is, of course, really strong. Level 82, 999 health, and some great moves, like that energy blast he once used against us. Make any final preparations you need to, and then it's on. Fly the ship back to Norn, head through the geoglyph, and we find ourselves headed towards a forgotten moon. After another tricky little looping lunar maze complete with dragons and other unspeakable monstrosities that attack you, you'll come up on what kind of looks like a government building. This is the Holy Temple of the Archangels, and it sucks gigantic ass. This dungeon is so big. Seriously, it's so big. Essentially, it consists of three branching paths, one down the left, one down the right, one down the middle. Each of these three branches goes on for way, way longer than I think it needs to, and the encounters never let up. There are like dozens of empty rooms along the way that serve no purpose other than to throw you off and waste your time. Technically, the left and right paths are optional, but they lead to excellent equipment, and without spoiling much, well, you'll want it. Yeah, scary shit's coming. You're gonna be in this hellhole, or perhaps heaven hole, for quite a while. You'll probably gain like 10 or 20 levels while you're here. After wandering endlessly throughout these golden hallways, at some point, maybe a few years from now, you'll come to Michael's throne. Michael is shocked that we've come so far and says he'd like to understand our motives. He asks us simply if we're of the Lord, which I suppose can't be denied, and then says that God is actually a wonderful man. Lazelle says that he doesn't give a shit about whatever God's forcing him to say, but Michael shoots back by saying he does have a will of his own and deals with God freely. Michael stresses that the way the world is now is actually pretty good. Evil never triumphs entirely, and it beats the way things used to be, where cruelty and chaos reign supreme. Apparently, Lagaya was created in the ashes of another planet and was reformed to be the way it is now. Finding this act of new creation incredibly inspiring, Michael is fully devoted to the current god and doesn't understand why we wouldn't be. Now, some of this got a little complicated for me to read, so I ran a couple of sentences through a translation program, and for some reason, it translated one of Michael's final questions as, what's your beef? Which I found extremely funny, and in my opinion should be seen as canon. You gotta watch out with using these translation programs, but sometimes it can give you some funny shit like that. So yeah, what's our beef? 
Michael says the truth is whatever we want to believe, and we should just head on home and leave things the way they are, and live out the rest of our lives as happy heroes. Obviously, the party's not having that, and so, Michael has no choice but to attack us. This guy boasts over 10,000 health, and is heavily resistant to status effects. Michael's group can even cast Ronka spells, which are devastating if they hit you, so you want to bring him down as fast as possible. Spam your best group targeting magic until his allies are defeated. Be sure you have Tarukaja and perhaps even Rakukaja active to boost your attack and defense, and have Lizelle on full healing duty. With the help of the Force Sword and a few lucky critical hits, you can do this, but if you see that Ronka shit about to let loose, have your whole party guard and hope for the best. Kinda freaky to see the enemy turn your own special move against you. Alright, with Michael down, we can proceed onwards, up a big staircase and into a portal. This is it. God's Realm, which is very reminiscent of how it was in Shin Megami Tensei IV Apocalypse. I'm not saying they got the idea from here, but maybe. Now think back, what kind of classic Megami Tensei dungeon have we not seen yet? Yeah, you know it, a fucking teleporter maze. You know I was gonna throw a fit if they didn't have one of these at the last second. There's no logic to it, man. This is a down and dirty, trial and error, shit fest of a maze. All I can say is just fucking do it. Test each possible path until it works. At the very least, you're not walking around very much. It's a pretty small stage, and I think they could have been a lot more mean about this if they wanted to. When you finally reach the end, well, are you ready? You're not. You're really not. I'm almost afraid to speak this into existence because we have to acknowledge it after this. Okay, enough dick yanking. Let me show you what this game's all about. You arrive on a golden platform deep in space. As you proceed forward, a thick yellow fog rolls in, blanketing everything. Out of the fog emerges a face. It's Yahweh, and he looks freaky as hell. No other monster or NPC in this game looks quite so... realistic? Like, it's an imprint of a real human face, not some cutesy sprite monster. And he says nothing, he just envelops you entirely, and the fight starts. Your first couple of rounds are pretty uneventful. You can damage him, but it just doesn't do anything. Quickly, Yahweh grows tired of observing us, and utterly annihilates the entire party with Megiddo Fire, an attack that deals 99,999 damage. As the group's consciousness fades, Louis hears the words of the goddess. She reminds us why we're here, what we set out to do, that we're the only ones who can do it. Louis stands up, and the fight resumes, as he's entirely alone. Now, he has a new ability in his spell list. The description reads, Ware amo, yui ni, ware ari. I think, therefore I am. If you're familiar with the Game Gear version of the first Last Bible, I'm sure you remember that. With all the willpower left in his body, our protagonist chooses to see his own reality, one where this god holds no power over us. After using the spell, the entire party is restored to life and Yahweh fades along with the yellow fog. It seems this version of God was only an illusion. And in front of us, God appears in his true form. I... I seriously can't even fucking believe it. What can I say? I thought for a long time about some kind of super funny joke to write here, but there isn't one. The fact that this is real is a far funnier punchline than anything I could ever come up with. The god of the last Bible universe that we're about to kill is a Kemi Nakajima from Digital Devil Story. 
You can't. This is like if Yu Narukami from Persona 4 just popped up in Shin Megami Tensei 5 and was like, yep, it was all my fault. Finding Minotaur everywhere is one thing, but this? This shit nearly sent me spiraling into insanity. What an absolutely mind-boggling twist. He remains completely silent, just looking at us. And then, the final boss begins. A battle against the creator of the world. Now, amongst the scant few out there that even know about this, I've seen at least one person doubt that this is truly Nakajima. But it most assuredly is. See, the name Akemi Nakajima doesn't actually appear in the game. He's simply referred to as the creator of the world. But they don't have to say it's Nakajima for it to be him. He's God, and has apparently been God for like, eons. He doesn't have a name anymore. And look at his sprite. The clearly Japanese school uniform, the haircut, the sword. He's carrying the Hino Kagetsuchi. Hino Kagetsuchi basically means Kagetsuchi's fire, and there it is, a flaming blade in his hand. And if that's not convincing enough, don't worry, there's plenty more to unpack after we beat him. This fight is a challenge for the ages. Nakajima fights viciously. Not only do you have to bring him down, he has two wings that can use their own attacks, meaning it's a battle against three bosses. The wing on the left can restore any health you chip away, so that's gotta be your first priority. It happens to have a weakness to sleep magic, so knock it out with that, and then, don't fucking touch it. You do not want to wake that thing up. Make sure it stays asleep, and focus all of your attacks on the opposite wing. The right wing can inflict horrible status effects to your entire party at once. They're seemingly random and can range from poison to sealing your magic to flat out paralysis and more. You can't put this one to sleep, but without the healing that the other provides, you at least have a shot of taking it out. Then of course, Nakajima. He can hit the whole team with powerful Indra arrows, and can deal upwards of 900 damage to individual units with his sword, which contains force energy. If he hits Lucifer with the sword, he flat out dies, which I think is very funny in a meta way, like, they were arch rivals in the Digital Devil Story novels, and of course, Lucifer is the final boss in the Digital Devil Story Famicom game. You can seal many of Nakajima's abilities, so try and do that once you've got the left side wing put to sleep. If you can finish off the right wing fast enough, your chances of survival are greatly boosted, but in my opinion, it's a pretty stiff challenge to get to that point. Even if you're healing first every round, you can still get caught up in some bullshit that just ruins your attempt, say perhaps the sleep spell not working one round and throwing everything off. My heart has scarcely beaten harder in my life than it has during this fight. It's a very fitting challenge for the end of this wild ride. After a brutal battle, Nakajima eventually collapses and finally speaks to us. Recognizing us as the true successor, he offers to tell us a little story until his body fades away. Long ago, when Nakajima was still human and the planet was still called Earth, people were not blessed with Gaia, which he likens to superpowers. Instead, they relied on the power of science. Machines known as airplanes flew through the skies, cars drove on roads, and the roads enveloped the world. Civilization had peaked, and yet it was nothing but chaos and bloodshed every day. Nakajima describes himself as a victim of that world, born in a small rich country that had lost touch with the meaning of life. Many of the country's inhabitants took their own lives, unable to find a true purpose. Instead of succumbing to the despair of it all, Nakajima decided that he would recreate the world and form a utopia, and upon filling his mind with that resolve, was met by the goddess who offered him the chance to do so. Inspired by a book created by an ancient civilization on Earth, likely the real Bible or the Torah, Nakajima began the creation of an ideal new world. This explains why we had to go up against an illusion of Yahweh. That's just what Nakajima decided God should look like in his world. With the fires of Megiddo, Nakajima set the old world aflame, and in its ashes, created the angels, the demons, Gaia, and of course, renamed Earth as Lagaya. In his eyes, 
a world where humans stand on the side of good and always triumph over evil is amazing. Everyone would always have a purpose and something heroic to place their trust in. Lazelle asks him what the real point of anything is in a world where the outcome is decided from the start, but all Nagajima says is that this way of living is coming to an end. We might not understand it, but to him, it was everything. Nakajima then predicts that, given enough time, things will end up this way again, wondering what kind of world we'll be creating as he finally disappears. I think that's meant to explain why the first Last Bible is so similar to this game. That game and the rest of the core trilogy take place hundreds of millions of years later, when things have started to stagnate again. Just a little theory though, don't quote me on that. Louis walks to the edge of the platform, and Alice asks him if the fighting will truly come to an end. She asks what will happen when it's all over, and then shrugs it off, apologizing for bothering us at such a pivotal moment. Alice says that we're a wonderful person, and starts to cry as Lazelle steps forward and says that it's been a great time working with us. He admits that he can't find the right words, and then, Louis rises off screen, becoming the next incarnation of the Great Will. God's realm begins to collapse, and Alice and Lazelle are tossed off of one of the platforms, waking up back on Lagaya. In a closing narration, Avon thanks the party for their efforts, satisfied with the conclusion of the story. Lazelle and Alice realize their powers have vanished, and that all that's left is to live a normal, happy life. Alice fears that the journey is finally over, but Lazelle is confident that things are only just beginning. And that's... Last Bible New Testament, one of the most unbelievable games this franchise has ever cooked up. I'm tempted to say it was incredible. There's a lot to talk about here, but actually, there is one more thing we can do with this game. If you just haven't had your fucking fix yet and need to play more of this, well, there's a post game. It's pretty quick, and it seems to be framed as a humorous, non-canon continuation of the story. Let's dive into this for a sec, and then we'll talk about what the fuck just happened. If you load up a completed save file, you'll be shown a cutscene where Avon is hanging out somewhere in the void. You remember Avon still, right? I kind of thought he'd end up being integral to the story in some way, but he really wasn't lying when he said he mostly wanted to watch. Anyway. Avon starts doing a mic check to himself. Seriously, he's clearing his throat and going, testing, testing. And then he calls out for Louie, asking if he'd come on down and have a quick talk back at the Oasis. So we stop being God for a minute, and the party just kind of magically reappears next to Michael's throne. Yeah, we don't start out back at the fucking Oasis like he wanted. We have to backtrack all the way there. What a load of shit. So walk all the way through the palace to the beginning, retrace your steps off the moon, get on the ship, fly back to Earth, and then finally go and visit Avon. The first thing Avon does is apologize for bothering us, but then he congratulates us for a job well done. He asks if we finally got the answer to life we were looking for, and then says that really nobody knows the answer to that, except him. He says he's looking forward to seeing what kind of world we create, and then gets down to business. Avon wants a favor. The interdimensional path back home is now infested with demons, perhaps because of all the crazy shit we just did to upset the old balance. If we're willing, Avon would like it if we'd go on down this staircase and clean things up for him. He's asking the fucking Great Will to clean rats out of his basement. To be fair, we are warned of a very powerful creature lurking within the furthest depths of this path. Step on down the stairs and we're in the Enkai, the home of the Old Ones, perhaps the most bullshitty dungeon of them all. The encounters are constant, though with our power level, they're hardly a threat. The first floor is simple enough, it's just a big maze, but the second floor? God save your soul. This shit is a fucking Yume Nikki map. I swear, it's just a giant, giant square, completely empty except for random candles placed around and you just have to find the stairs. When I say this fucker's huge, I mean huge, big, big room. The stairs aren't far from where you start, but with hardly anything to navigate with, they might as well be thousands of miles away. Fuck this place. 
if you can track down the exit. Then you have to deal with a series of corridors that repeat themselves endlessly unless you choose the right path. And finally, what are you met with after all that? A boss that'll beat your shit sideways. In that same dimly lit cave room we saw at the very start of the game is the mysterious beast Avon made his contract with. It hungrily asks if we're food, and then, here we go. It's Sathagwa, straight out of Lovecraft. The design is frankly horrifying and suits what an ancient evil who lurks in a horrific dimension should look like. It's hard to even know where to look with this guy, there's just so much going on. I like it. Sathagwa has over 40,000 HP, which is like four times as much as Nakajima, and just goes cuckoo crazy on your ass. He's got attacks that can do over a thousand damage, he can do status effects on your party, he can absorb damage he deals to you back as health sometimes. It's some shit. Truly, this game's ultimate challenge. Your only chance is to have 1. Very high levels for your party, 2. Demons with the highest agility stats you can find, and 3. Constant buff spells. Sathagwa can be poisoned, which really helps, and he can be sealed, but there's so much health to work through that you're really going to have to craft the ultimate party to pull through. And you know what? Just beating him is cool. If you can do it, Avon thanks you. But there's a challenge out there for the sick and godforsaken, if that's not enough. If you can beat Sathagwa in 10 turns or less, there is a brief secret cutscene in which you retrieve Avon's book, which our guy here apparently swallowed. 10 fucking turns to wear down 40,000 health. With post-game fusions, it's doable, but Jesus Christ, I mean, good fucking luck. You know what? If any of you do it, go ahead and tell me. We're married now. All in all, while this post-game chapter isn't something super serious plot-wise, it is a bit of fun, and I think it's cool they even made it in the first place. Whew, and that's really the end of Last Bible New Testament. This game surprised me on so many levels. It was more fun than I expected, the story had more care and thought put into it than I expected, the battle sprites were great, the music's pretty good, and you get a post-game. It goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the original Last Bible, and I honestly think it's much better overall. And seriously, how about that ending? I know, I know, I just keep talking about it, but seriously, I know some of you lore people out there are gonna have fun with this one. Just think of all the implications. The last Bible games take place in the universe of Digital Devil Story. The world must have ended in the 1980s or the 1990s because of Nakajima, and all became Last Bible. It's up to you if you accept that as part of your own canon or whatever, but regardless, it's pretty hilarious that someone even thought of it. Maybe that's why these games have so many minotaurs and towers. Nakajima must have had a lot of unsettled emotions towards that guy. Jokes aside, it's really entertaining stuff, and it leaves some questions up in the air for speculation. For example, where's Yumiko? I don't think she'd be the reincarnated goddess from this game. And does Megami Tensei 2 still happen in this timeline? Does Nakajima reform the Earth after the nukes drop in that one? I'd like to hear some of your guys' theories in the comments. I'd say this game is like a C plus tier game when compared to the entire franchise. It's not mechanically perfect, and admittedly, with how obscure it is, it doesn't really offer much to a casual fan. But if you're the kind of person that wants to dive deep into the series and learn as much as you can, and you don't mind some old-fashioned JRPG gameplay, you gotta check this out. Thanks to all of you who watched this far. I really appreciate it. I know this was a long one, but I have to say, this was one of my favorite projects, and I had a lot of fun making it. This has been the Shinyaku Last Bible Experience, and as always, I'll see you guys in the next video.